So with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, our presenters for today's webinar, Dr. Stacy Feiner and Dr. Christina Moran. Stacy. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, I'm really excited to be here and um, as you can imagine, being a psychologist in business during COVID-19, there is an um, influx of interest in psychology and business psychology. And I'm really proud that um, my company, Cynamics, is in full force, ready to, um, ready to serve. So um, are you going to be moving the slides forward? Yes, I will be. Okay, so I'll just... So give you a thumbs up when you can move it forward. So kindly move, yeah, forward. Um, so I'm Dr. Stacy Feiner. I hail originally from Boston. I've been in Cleveland for now um, about 18 years, and I have been working as a business psychologist and coach for the, my entire career. Actually, I believe I was born and put on the earth to do this. Uh, Cynamics is a network of business psychologists we are the primary advisors to operating businesses all over the country, and we have an impeccable track record for helping businesses grow and, um, and mature. And uh, we have, we're right now offering very straightforward programs proven during the crisis to help leaders stay solvent and to grow. And just to give you a quick summary of that, we, are, um, we have a product or a program called Outside Counsel to HR, which allows human resource professionals to call on experts for sensitive matters, for complex issues, or just a sounding board, sometimes for a second pair of hands. We know financial services or financial departments can call on their boards and their accounting firms. We know that legal issues get outside counsel and outside law firms, but human resources has yet to have a dedicated outside counsel source for them, and we are that. Um, Virtual boards, a lot of businesses right now need boards more than ever and don't have them. We are providing a virtual board. We have somebody on my right who's a revenue person and a person on my left who is a, a supply chain person and I'm the psychologist and we create the conditions for a very impactful conversation to answer urgent questions immediately. We're gonna to talk today more about contingency planning continuity planning, and actually this really cool thing we've, we've nailed, it's called scenario planning. If we do all, if we consider all of the scenarios that you and your firm, your companies are concerned with in anticipation of people returning to work, we can categorize them, create specific project plans for those scenarios, and then combine it into one continuity plan. It's the guidebook and it'll be incredibly valuable. That's what we're gonna get into today. And then portfolio performance for companies that have a portfolio of companies we help integrate and decentralize so that all the, uh, or I'm sorry, centralize so all of the decentralized resources can come together for the purposes of the recovery. Okay, kindly, oh. Also, we have a short, that's fine. We have a short survey if anybody would like to take to help them recognize where, they are, where there are gaps in their continuity planning, their uh, scenario planning, and today's presentation will point that out very clearly. I'm working in tandem today with my very good friend and longtime colleague, Christina Moran. Christina Moran is an IO psychologist. I am a business psychologist, clinical psychologist, and we work in uh, business in very specific ways, and Christina is dedicated to a company called Marshberry. They provide benefits globally to companies, and she is an IO psychologist dedicated to um, a revenue channel in that business. These are other members of our team. We have Tom Swales, who's a forensic psychologist, and Christina um, Miklos, who does assessments. Okay, thank you. Here's our agenda. We're gonna talk about getting back to work, how to help your employees feel strong. We're gonna talk about creating a safe place and making sure people know what to do. Um, we're gonna define the new space so that people know how to uh, be productive. And we're gonna talk about, I think we have about 12 or maybe 15 scenarios that we've kind of begun to work through with Ron and Rick's help 
at Manufacturing Works, they did a survey of all of you so that we could really be spot on with the kind of scenarios that you're concerned about and we can be proactive about helping you through. Okay, next slide kindly. Okay, so let me just nail this um, back to work. It's the same but different. Um, actually, what is the same and different to each person? I was, on a, I was on a podcast the other day and I said, to most people, everything looks the same. What's different is people feel different. And somebody else on the call said, no, no nothing looks the same. And people are, fi fi are finally fi trying to feel better because they're back home and they're, they're, they're melding their lives and they have a new normal that they're kind of liking. So I thought to myself, nobody is having the same experience today. And that's gonna be one of the challenges as you think about reintroducing your employees back to the workplace on site is that everybody's having a different experience. I've kind of understood this, that there are three waves. There was the quarantine, at which time everybody was on high alert and basically everybody's energy was kind of, we were all kind of in it together. Um, then we had the wave two, which we're just coming out of, which is while you're home, stay solvent, stay solvent during the stay at home. Um, again, some, some businesses, manufacturing companies had been put on um, the essential list and their concerns were they couldn't find enough material or equipment to, or product to actually keep up with demand. And then there were other companies that were non-essentials and within the first week, there were some folks who were losing 90% of their, their employees. So it's been very tentative across the board. And wave three is the return to work. And all of the, what do we do? How do we do it? How do we keep people safe? How do we stay in compliance? How do we keep people, people productive? What if people don't want all of the concerns? Uh, how do we report are the things that we're gonna talk about today? So Cynamics is offering scenario planning today and to business owners and their teams. So whatever we don't get answered today, um, we are available to you. Okay, thank you. Next slide, okay. Um, next slide. So I wanna talk about how to keep people safe, um, how to create a safe place. This is the kind of the feeling strong side of it. Christina will talk about the what to do side of it. Um, so let's get into it so that I can, we can really get to the scenarios. Next slide, next slide. I'm not sure, but most people are not aware that there are 16 disciplines of psychology at play at work at one time. Um, the three prominent psychologies that most people are aware of are uh, quantitative, which has to do with testing, behavioral, which is what everybody's being assessed on with performance reviews, is behavioral oriented. What do you see? What behaviors are being demonstrated? And then developmental, because we know that people develop, they grow, and they go from one position to the next. That's kind of the progression of careers, and that's considered developmental. All of these other psychologies are at play in business, but not typically may, are people aware of them. Forensic psychologists are studying and helping people create safe workplaces. They're focused a lot on um, violence in the workplace, or when people are injured, they do um, uh, back to work assessments. Um, social psychology, of course, is really the essence of how to build great teams. Again, we're doing it, but we're not always using the, the true, um, the powerful tools of psychology and the theories and techniques behind that. So there are 16 disciplines of psychology at work, and we are trying to bring more psychologies to help solve problems once and people problems once and for all. Okay, next, next slide. So from psychology, we go to, I mean, from psychology, we go to personality. Personality is made up of all of these things that are invisible to most people, right? Your psychology is invisible. Your attachment, how you learn to be attached to people, bumps into identity, bumps into motivation, bumps into perception, then bumps into attributes, and all of these things create internal emotional experiences from all of these non-linear dynamics and facets of your psychology, and they get played out as behaviors. Um, as stress, 
physiological, the things that we can see. Now imagine all of these, so one thing to make, keep in mind is we all have our own unique psychology made up of these very same things, but our experiences that are attached to them are very different. If you don't, if you don't have access to your psychology, you are limited to how you can use your own psychology to propel you fo forward. Business psychology and coaching helps people see inside to their own psychology and use their psychology to grow and evolve and those and meet their goals, which is what most people are working to do. So we need to get more access to who we are as individuals to exponentially grow at an accelerated pace. Now imagine one person connects with another person. Here's what's gonna happen at work. And these psychologies are now very stressed. So you have all these things happening for one person invisibly, you bring another person together, all of these things are happening invisibly for them, coming together. Now add five people, now 10 people, now 100 people. And you can see that there's an emotional current that is being created that you as leaders don't yet have access to. And my job and Christina's job in the work of Cynamics is to give leaders access so that they can shape the emotional dynamics of their organization so they don't have lingering and perpetual performance issues. Next slide. So um, again, I don't wanna rush too much, but this has been incredibly valuable. Here's what's happening from that psychology Here's how people are going to be showing up. Here's how you and I are showing up. Needs that drive emotions. There is Maslow's hierarchy. I want to stress this because this is going to be important information, an important model for all of you to manage the various and intense emotions of each one of your employees. So I'm going to stress that. Five levels of personality, of emotion. The first thing people need, this is a hierarchy and it goes up, the first thing people need before they can do anything else, before they can show up and be productive for you, they need to have their basic needs met, their physiological needs met. They need food, water, shelter, and rest. If we can make the assumption that most people in your worlds, that's not everybody's world, I know a number of companies whose employees are hand to mouth right now, but most of your employees have their physiological needs being met. So now they're in the safety realm, right? Emotional and physical safety from harm, economic security. We are all challenged around this very uh, area of safety needs. We have not lived in this space for the last 40 years. Um, this is critical space and people, this is where you get kind of that toilet paper hoarding. People are trying to protect them and theirs, right? With, 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 because they're, because they're, they're, um, now their focus narrows in crisis. When we get that, now this is going to be valuable to business because now the need to belong is heightened. People have been isolated and they need a sense of belonging. Their draw to come back to work will be greater for most people. But when they show up to work, they won't be able to hug. And all of these like non-verbals of like kind of stay away is going to impede and, and hurt people's feelings unwittingly when everybody's going to be glad to be back. It's going to be like, I'm so glad to see you. And then it's going to be like, stay away. It's going to be very complicated. Um, if you haven't experienced those things already. Okay, self-worth, this is where it's about us. So... We have a sense of belonging. Now we want to be efficacious. We want to contribute. We want to be acknowledged and important. We want to feel good about ourselves. Again, that has been very difficult for people to do, even with the, the best intentions of being home, right? They want to do great work. Now they want to do great work for their families. And these are, these are things that are colliding. So again, we're very on unstable ground. Finally, so actualization is when all of your needs are met, you have the opportunity to consider, the, oops, excuse me about that, consider the greater good. I'm um, oh, sorry about that. To, to consider the greater good. Um, now, what's really important with this is we have been looking out for each other. That has been the message of humanity and, and being, um, um, offering people some latitude 
Um, so this is the first time in ever in my life, and for many of you, to be in, your, your foot is stretched in both camps, very focused on your own physiological and safety needs, protecting you and yours, all the way over to considering the greater good. This split, this pull, has been so exhausting on our psychology, and it has manifested in stress. So you have stress about meeting your needs, being financially solvent, um, continuing to serve your clients and generate revenue. You've had all, plus you've been stretched in these two camps, these extreme camps. Um, so we're stretched to the max. If nothing else, these are all of the complex things that your employees are gonna be experiencing and showing up with. Okay, so now let's go to this next slide. And what will be helpful here is, again, a very quick set of tools when you are working with high-stressed people. First of all, we want to keep people moving up Maslow's hierarchy of needs because the lower you go, the more stress you're experiencing and the narrowing of your thinking and the poorer of your judgment. Your thinking narrows and your judgment goes down. In fact, again, that hoarding toilet paper thing had to do with the lowest level of thinking, which is if they're doing it, I better do it. And so one of the most important things as leaders of companies is your decision might ultimately look like everybody else's, but you should take the time to make it your decision. Make it your decision. And that's why sometimes the virtual board has been so helpful because Business owners will say, well, I've seen other people in manufacturing works, they're saying on webinars that they've done this and this, I better do that. And then this virtual board is able to say, okay, let's just make sure it makes sense for you and not just make sense now, but to make sure you're not making a decision in a vacuum that would put you behind right now as you're coming back to work or in six months when you need to ramp up. You don't want decisions that you're making today to negatively impact decisions in the future. So we need to keep people moving up and there are four particular ways of doing it and they're not particularly intuitive. One is when somebody comes very stressed is simply to acknowledge and it's a simple sentence. I hear you. I understand what you're saying. That sounds very stressful. Um, all, only things that relate to the fact that you acknowledge what they're feeling. For some people, that might de-escalate them. For some people, it might cause them to cry harder or to uh, feel the permission to feel more. So, But in those situations, people can and will pick themselves up if you continue to acknowledge. Then reassure, and the reassurance comes from this is time sensitive or this is a point in time, just like I said, remember the quarantine. First it was the quarantine. Then we moved to the stay at home. Now we're moving to back to work. This is a continuum. There's a calendar of events and you can be in control of it. Four, third is to share, to, to, um, to, 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 to divulge. These are things that I've experienced. I'm experiencing similar things to reveal, to self-reveal, to, to, and then all of these things together create the necessary conditions for connection that will allow people to engage back at work, okay? I'm available anytime to talk about this some more, but this is very important to help people think, get out of closed thinking and move up so that they can make good judgment. It's kind of like breathing. You need to quiet your physical system so that you can think with reason. And that's very important during this phase. Okay, next slide. Uh, next slide, let me just, um, let me see what the next slide is. Hold on one second. Okay, go back to the forward slide. Okay, so what this all means to business, okay, so I don't want anybody to think that I believe that your businesses are mental health centers. You know, I don't think your universities either and you have large training programs or you outsource your training. I don't think your medical health centers either, though you spend a lot of time worrying about benefits. I recognize, we recognize that your main job is to produce for customers, right? 
is production. And in that way, you generate revenue for your employee base, okay? But right now, we are gonna be focusing on the employees so that they can restart the engine to get back to productivity. So it's gonna be about communicating. It's gonna be, and we'll talk more about this. I don't, it's not just one word. It's a whole set of things we'll talk about. Productivity, get people back to productivity so they know their role. Alignment, bringing people together so people can start leveraging each other and then mobilizing. And this is when we're gonna start hearing the, um, start hearing things hum. So I'm confident that we will get things humming. Okay, thank you, next slide. Okay, so I'd like to turn this over to Christina. I've just talked about creating a safe space, a place. Christina's gonna talk about defining the new space and that will be focused on what to do. I focused on what to feel and this will focus on what to do and this will be lots about the protocol and a lot of the scenarios will start with this and then I'll chime in back to what the emotions are, okay? Thank you everybody, I appreciate your time. Christina? Thank you, Stacy. As Stacy mentioned, I'm Dr. Christina Moran. Thank you everybody for having me. Um, I do work for Marsh Ferry, a financial consulting firm to the insurance industry. I am their vice president of organizational development and learning. I'm also helping them with our return to office plan as well. We have six offices throughout the United States and one office in the Netherlands. Um, we have had employees contract COVID-19. So we've been doing quite a bit of work ourselves, just trying to figure out what all this means for us. So as Stacey mentioned, the next thing we're going to talk about is defining the space and preparing for what we're going to do. So Anne, if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide. Thank you. We're going to talk quite a bit about the protocols at work and we can go to the next one as well. Okay, so how are we going to do this? We're going to start with this basic overview. We're going to plan, we're going to communicate, we're going to focus on the safety, but also plan for the contingency. And I'm sure these are all things that you've already thought about, it's just putting them in that organized way of what we're going to do from a step-by-step -step process. So in that planning piece, that's what we're doing right now, right? We're gathering all the intelligence, we're listening to our governors, we're figuring out what are the best um, prescriptions they can give us as far as safety goes, but we have to modify them and plan for our own facilities and our own workspaces. Communicate. This cannot be um, overstated the importance of communicating. And so when we're communicating to our staff, we need to not take anything for granted, right? We need to tell them everything we're doing, also why we're doing it, so that they can be on board and be ambassadors for the plan instead of just listening to us doing the right thing when we're there and then going and doing their own thing when we're not there. Communicating the why in each of our plans is really that key component to making sure that what we're trying to achieve does stick when we are not actually physically right there next to them. Um, safety, we're going to talk quite a bit about in this section and then contingency planning. Even with the best plans, we know that there are going to be scenarios that we couldn't have foreseen um, or didn't hope would happen. And we have to figure out what the best way is for us to move forward in those situations. So Anne, if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide, we'll start to get into this a bit more. And talk about scenario planning. You can go to the next one as well, thank you. Um, if anybody has specific questions, you can feel free to chime in, use the chat function as well. Um, I know we're gonna be very respectful of the ending at four o'clock today, but I wanna make sure that your questions do get answered to the extent that we can. So in this scenario planning section, thinking about those stressors as people leave their homes and return to the office. And Stacy mentioned a number of those. Uh, we don't wanna make this entire webinar about mental health, but it cannot be um, mentioned enough how much that is going to be a factor in the success of our plans moving forward. What I mean by that is that we can have great plans, we can communicate effectively, but if our employees are in a state of fear or feeling like things are too uncertain or too unsafe, as Stacy mentioned, their judgment is going to be at risk. And that judgment at risk in an environment where safety is king could be very detrimental. So as much as we don't wanna make our main focus everybody's mental health, it has to be on our radar or else the, some of those things can influence the way that we are productive or not in the workplace. 
So Stacy mentioned a bunch of those. I won't reiterate there, but I want to leave you with one takeaway, which is that people are regressing during this time. And I know that might be something that seems like psychologists speak to you. Um, you know, psychologists like to focus on the childhood and things like that quite a bit. And that's not really what I'm saying, though. What I'm saying is that when people don't feel safe, they have a tendency to revert back to that feeling that, you know, they want their mother or they want their father or their parent there, whoever kept them safe at a young age, because that feels like protection to them. And so when people aren't feeling safe right now, they're regressing. So you might see arguments in the workplace about things that seem very trivial and silly. It's related to that feeling of not feeling safe. Um, and so as Stacy mentioned, you can get at that with empathy, things like, I understand how you feel. And if I were you, I would feel the same way. You're not saying that you do feel the same way. You're saying if you were them, you would feel that way because obviously they're them and they are feeling that way. And a lot of times that can help them, you know, take a deep breath, lower their guard, have a constructive conversation, or at least acknowledge that there's emotions there, uh, which can really lead to more productive paths forward. So a big feeling that people are going to be having is feeling unsafe. Um, maybe feeling some wondering about the state that the business is in or how many customers we have and things like that because things are in a bit of turmoil from a market perspective right now. Um, so those are just some of the feelings that people might be thinking or, or having going back into the workplace that we just need to be mindful of, not dismissive. If we're dismissive, that's where we have some counterproductive work behaviors and things like that and, and things that don't go as well. So um, thinking about empathy, thinking about ways that you can acknowledge their feelings without diving too deeply into agreeing with them. You don't have to agree, but just acknowledging. Yep, next slide, Anne. Thank you. Okay, so communicating. So obviously we have physical distancing on here. I know everybody's probably thinking about how can we make sure our employees are staying six feet apart at all times to the extent that we can, um, wearing masks. We're going to talk about PPE in a little bit, personal protective equipment, um, and how that factors in at the workplace. But again, just communicating everything to people is extremely important. Um, one more point on the mental health on this slide is related to that catastrophizing uh, versus mobilizing. So again, overcoming that mental barrier that this is a, a scary situation and getting them to feel rallied around a goal, what that goal is. If it's um, a certain revenue target for the company or a certain amount of output for the company or even just keeping, our, keeping each other safe, um, whatever those goals are, communicating those and rallying the people around them are things that will be important. So, Anne, if you want to go to the next slide, thank you. And we'll be talking a little bit more about some of those contingencies. So what happens if somebody isn't aligned or something does happen that we're not expecting? Uh, we'll be working through those as well. So alignment is important, obviously, ensuring there aren't those hidden agendas there. And the only way really to get at that is to have a clear objective, communicate it, and then talk to people, right? If people are going against that, then you have to address that with them directly. And I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but addressing that with them directly, understanding their side, presenting your side, working on a collaboration, so what we're going to do going forward with each other is extremely important. Um, I do see a question here, so I'll just check this out really quickly. Many employees are making more at home than returning to work. How do we tackle the frustration of leaving the safe environment and having to come back to work where the government financial safety is now disrupted by the reality of making less? We already received questions from employees that they wanna discuss this. That's a really great question, and I know a lot of people have this on their minds, I'm sure employees and business owners so what I think about when I think about this question is a couple of different components. One, somebody might come in and ask for more money. So I think everybody on this call needs to be prepared for that scenario where they're approached by whether it's collectively their employees or one or two or you know, separate one-off employee cases where somebody's going to ask for more money. Um, so I think being prepared for that, having a um, stance on what you think is appropriate for the business and how you have made those compensation uh, decisions in the past is very important. So if you've used market research or you've used other outside sources or salary bands or anything like that to formulate the pay that you have decided on for your employees, dust those off, make sure that you understand them, you're comfortable reiterating them to your employees. 
Um, obviously, as the market goes up, you might be forced into a situation where um, people need to make more in order for you to get the uh, personnel that you need. But in the same sense, I think for them, it's not necessarily communicating, communicating that they should be thankful that they got that benefit. Um, but, you know, it is partially communicating that we can't control what the government's decisions are. Certainly, this was a decision in the best interest of our collective society. We all agree with that. We all support that we all think that that was the right thing to do. Um, unfortunately, it is temporary though. And the way that unemployment works is if you are called back to work, that is a requirement of receiving unemployment, at least in the state of Ohio, which is where we reside. So I don't wanna communicate it, I wouldn't communicate it as they don't have a choice, um, but at the same sense, softening it and also reiterating that to them that they're needed at work, they're wanted at work, we're doing our best here at work, um, you know, if they have to come back, then re realistically, the way that the Ohio Revised Code works is that they're not allowed to collect unemployment anymore if they do have that ability to go back to their former employer. Um, and obviously, there's lots of things in there that you'll need to work through. But those are just some of the things I think about. I, I do think it's going to have to be a conversation um, if it does come up. I don't think that you can ignore it or um, it will just go away. I think it will potentially get louder. And so I would advise you to, again, review your market research. How did you come up with your compensation um, levels and bands and rates prior to this event? Dust those off, uh, reinforce those with your employees, but then also communicate to them that this is a benefit of what the government has felt like is necessary at this point, but that's not a, a permanent reality. That's not a long-term reality. Our long-term reality is through our, our employer and we're gonna work on that. So hopefully I answered that question, um, but if not, please feel free to follow up. I'm happy to, to answer as best I can. Thank you, Fernando. Okay, um, and Stacy mentioned the outside counsel to HR. This is something that Dynamics provides through Stacy's company, um, and they can work on that with you as well. So Anne, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. So the safety message. So communicating the safety protocols that will be in place when employees return. I know a lot of you are already thinking about masks. Um, the governor has either strongly recommended or required masks in certain workplaces um, or every workplace. So that is something that we'll all have to do um, as we return to work. Disinfecting is something that has come up quite a bit as well. A lot of employers are concerned about having the appropriate disinfecting. Uh, chemicals and solutions and products that they might need. And so one scenario might be that you run out of it or what happens if you're running low and you can't get more? Do you have to close down? How does that work? Um, so there's lots of things within your plan that I think think about best case scenario, how does this go? But also worst case scenario, how does this go? How could this go wrong? Which pieces of our chain could break? And what are our other options? Is it sending somebody to Costco or whatever your retailer of choice is and seeing if they have it on the shelf for you? Is it having a list of three or four or five suppliers that you have a rotating subscription of disinfecting um, products with that they're all delivering at different times? So if one runs out, you've got enough of a supply, but then the next one's coming in two weeks um, and you know you'll keep being restocked unless there are multiple outages with multiple vendors. Um, there's lots of things related to that. You know, do you have to have employees clean their workspaces every so often, disinfect? And then do you have to provide them protocols for that so that they're doing it properly? So those are some of the things related to safety um, that, that we are thinking about and that I think a lot of businesses are thinking about, especially in a manufacturing sense. Thank you, Anne. Okay, so screenings is a big one. I do want to spend a bit of time on this in comparison to the other ones. Um, what hospitals are saying is that they're using sort of two means to screen their employees upon entry. One is a daily checklist of physical symptoms that they're asking for, um, as well as the uh, thermometers and checking the fevers. So if somebody is coming into the hospital to work, they're checking their temperature first and foremost. They're also putting them through um, a physical symptom questionnaire, which is very brief. It just asks one or two or three questions related to having a fever or having any other physical symptoms that are related to COVID-19 before they're allowed entry. 
So as you're thinking about that, this is one of the areas that I know our team is feeling, um, I don't want to say the least comfortable with, but also wondering about how it's actually going to play out. And part of it could be somebody has to be there, right, checking the temperature. So whether you're using an infrared camera or you're using a physical thermometer that somebody's putting on the person and then disinfecting after every single one, um, somebody physically has to be there to check and verify that people are coming in and that their temperatures are okay. So who is going to do that? Who is going to sit at the front or the entrance, or if you have multiple entrances, sit at each one um, and make sure that every person checked, um, every person who comes in is checked. And how are you going to catalog that? If you do have more than one entrance, then at some way you'll need some sort of master list to say, okay, all these people are here. They're all good from a temperature perspective. They're all good from a symptom perspective. Um, and that can be a lot. So obviously, Cynamics is a company that works with leaders on that to try to help them with that. Um, but also, what happens if you do have somebody that it does agree to having some of the physical symptoms, but thought they could be there for work, or their fever is, um, they do have a fever, and they checked it at home before they left, and they were checked the day before coming into work, and they didn't have it, and now all of a sudden they have it, right? They're going to feel um, a little bit scared, possibly stigmatized. For having that, you know, they would probably wonder if people would think that they should have known that they were sick before coming in. So I think there's going to be some defensiveness on employees' parts. You can anticipate that if they are found to be, quote, in violation of the um, temperature thresholds or the physical symptom uh, thresholds. So I would anticipate some defensiveness, some fear as well. What does this mean for me? Do I get paid for not being at work during this time? You know, did I expose people at my company to it? Um, any of that type of stuff. And remember, we're not saying that this is a positive COVID-19 test. We're just saying they have a fever. They might not have COVID-19. They may have something else that's going around. So just remembering that every time you screen somebody, it doesn't necessarily mean they have COVID-19. If they have a positive test, that's obviously a different case. Um, and positive tests need to be reported to the health department. The organization does need to close, close down for disinfecting, um, thinking about how long that is gonna take. So if you do have somebody who's positive, who's going to report it to the health department? How long is it going to take to disinfect and what needs to be disinfected? And I would think about what your employees need to feel safe coming back in. Obviously you need to do what's best for the business, but if your employees don't feel safe because they think only certain things were disinfected or, you know, we forgot this or we forgot that, then that's going to lead to that hypervigilant behavior um, that we call it, that Stacy mentioned that happened very early on in the quarantine where people were looking over their shoulder and grabbing the last toilet paper and, you know, sort of getting into arm wrestling matches in the grocery stores over different products. Um, so you don't want to have that hypervigilance and, and just thinking one step ahead and protecting them. Um, and then that can be good. And we have another question here. So if they do have a fever, do we have to report and do we have to pay them during the time they are out? So if they do have a fever, I don't believe you have to report that because that could be caused by multiple things. Um, if you have a COVID-19 positive, I do believe that the current guidance is that you have to report that and close down and disinfect. Um, in terms of paying for the time they are out, I don't know what the latest guideline is from the federal government and the state, and sometimes they're conflicting about whether you need to pay them or not. I don't believe anything has been passed mandating pay for the time they are out, but I'm going to pause there and let Stacy answer in case she knows something more than I do there. Um, no, I think I'm just gonna leave that alone. I think we've covered it enough and there are a couple more scenarios and we're getting tighter for time. So thank you, Christina. Sure, sure. Yep. I think that's one of the things that we can follow up with directly um, with Stacey on after the fact. And Agreed. obviously things are changing. So um, by the time we have the next conversation, it might be even different. Okay, right. so Pete, go ahead, Stacey. I was just going to say, you know, one of the things to we also need to be thinking about as part of this uh, scenario planning is, um, you know, the we're going back to work to for, for some people earlier than um, is, was expected. And so there might potentially be another wave of the virus. So we, that's part of this whole contingency planning process. I 
Yep, that's an excellent point. Um, what could happen as well as not just having one person at work who becomes positive, but what if you have, what, what is the threshold of a critical mass of employees for you that if they became positive, you might not be able to fulfill customer orders or do sort of the essential services that you need to keep your business running. Um, so that is another one of those scenarios that we hope doesn't happen. But if you do have one person who is very, um, very contagious and does spread it quite a bit throughout your organization before it's uncovered, possibly asymptomatic, um, how could you survive as a business if X percent of your workforce went down with it, you know, 10 to 15 percent, maybe even more? So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so we talked a bit about social distancing. Um, I think everybody's thinking about this from a major workplace standpoint and how everybody's doing in their own workspaces. Other things to think about are common areas. So for example, at our organization, restroom doors are closed. That's a point of contact for people to have to pull that handle. So what other points of contact are people touching that you could minimize. I know some organizations are looking at automatic doors that slide open and close versus doors that people have to pull open and shut. Um, obviously that could be a big financial investment, but I would encourage you to review any of those things that people could be touching throughout a day. I know it could be quite a bit and it could become overwhelming, but to the extent that you could minimize those, that would be ideal, I think, for preventing the spread of this virus. Um, also reporting. So reporting is multidimensional in the sense that you need to think about how could an employee report a concern. Um, we know that employees can report concerns directly to the health department. Obviously, no business owner would want that to report it directly to the health department without giving them an opportunity to mitigate it themselves first. So creating that culture of empathy and support and we're all in this together and safety first and all that type of stuff. Um, making sure that people feel comfortable and know the way that they can report it internally so that if it does need to be addressed, it's addressed, it's swiftly, it's comprehensively, um, and that if it's not something that needs to be reported to the health department, then it doesn't result in that being an added layer of something that you have to deal with. We also talked about if somebody's positive having to report that as well. Um, Anne, would you mind going to the next slide? Okay, so who will receive the concerns and how will they be followed up with? So that's another dimension of reporting, not just who is doing the reporting, but also who's receiving the reporting and then what plans do they have from a next step from there. So in all your scenarios, be thinking about best case, worst case, what could happen in between, what are all the different layers of things we might be able to anticipate, but then also what would we need to do about it from there? What's step one, step two, step three, step four? Um, again, I know there's a lot to think about, and especially at this time and state of the world, um, but to the extent that you can map those out on paper in advance, I think you'll feel more comfortable, and then that comfort will be communicated to your employees, too, through your verbals and nonverbals. And then also communicating to the workforce. So I've seen a lot of businesses communicating to their consumers and letting them know what to expect when they come back to, war to their um, places that they patronize. So think about that in relation to your employees. What can you tell them about being excited to have them back, knowing that our first priority is safety, um, a couple things that have been done in the interim to prepare so that they feel like they're walking into an environment where people are focused on their health and well-being, um, and, and also keeping the business up and running, right? As much as some people might feel like their health and well-being is first. At many people, 1A or number two is making sure that they have a livelihood going forward as well. So they want that business to be um, continuing on and doing well so that they can be employed. So any of those things that you can be thinking about to help your staff uh, prepare to come back in would be great. Thank you, Anne. Okay, we also talked about um, communicating, so I'm not gonna go into that too much more, but obviously the note to suppliers there as well, I think is important. So your, your retail customers or your, your B2B customers are one component. Your employees are sort of another customer in a way. They're a customer of your leadership and your guidance and, and your company's success. Um, you also have your suppliers who are critical to your success as well. So just thinking about all those stakeholders and what you can do proactively to tell them, we're on it, we care, we're doing our best, we're keeping up with regulations, those things go a very, very long way. And then contingency, we've talked about this 
in all these different scenarios. What can we do um, if things don't go our way? If they go away, we're not hoping that they go. What are the steps that we can take? Um, you know, even just mapping out who the first call is going to be to, whether that's to somebody you work with or, you know, dynamics or um, attorney, something like that, whoever it is, just knowing what your first step is going to be in each case at a time that's overwhelming and scary can be great to have on paper um, as a first step. Next slide, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna pause there. Stacy. anything you wanna jump back in on? Yes, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, that, that was just stellar work, um, Christina, and I appreciate that. One thing I really wanna, drive home is that the intention is not to create anxiety for you. The intention is to let you know that um, we, we, we know how to prepare and there's a process for preparing. And I've been with a number of different business owners and here's what they say. They say, Stacy, that sounds great. Let me think about it. Well, not let me think about it. Let me put some thought to what the plan needs to be and then I'll come back to you. And I'm like, no, that's not how it works. Let's build the plan right now together. Like, let's go to the whiteboard, draw the name of the scenario, you know, and then we'll do the workflow. And where you can't answer the questions or we can't, we'll leave spaces there. And I will go or my team will go back or your team will go back and find those answers. These are blueprints, essentially, and they are easy enough to put in place. They, you don't have to prepare. You just have to start laying it out. So I just want you to know it is right. It's kind of a turnkey process, but you have to just have the whiteboard and get it started. That's my point. Um, and I open up to questions. Any, any additional questions? I don't know if I can see them. Yeah, Stacy, there is a question here. It says, uh, is there a list of common indicators of stress in the workplace? What can peers or employers look for to indicate an employee may be adversely affected by stress? Well, I think that's a really great question. And a couple things. Um, one are some of the obvious things. Um, like this person's behavior is different than it was before. Okay. So there's you, we need to be familiar with each other when we can be. This isn't rocket science, right? We need to trust what we're seeing and what we're feeling with each other. So one is just a baseline. Uh, most of us are not at our regular baseline. Uh, so that's one. Um, you know, listening for words. Again, things that um, would cause you, you know, maybe question or concern at this point of time leave nothing for, um, for your imagination. Ask. Um, also have somebody in place who can do, who can be that buffer. So you can have kind of like a, um, kind of an ombudsman. Anybody who has a concern about somebody report or brings it that concern to that person and allows that person to kind of um, touch base, be kind of the, the, the keep the pulse. Uh, if you have a person identified for that and everybody kind of agrees with that, then it's not reporting to anybody. It's just, again, keeping your finger on the pulse. Um, also, unusual behavior. Um, that would be something, obviously, to indicate. And again, I think that what's very valuable is to have, um, I don't know if it needs to be regular, um, but consistent weekly check-ins and to have the courage when you are observing something to say you know i just want to check and see if things are okay if and and before you answer whether things are feeling okay or not i have a couple of ideas maybe i could just run through the ideas before you let me know if you need them or not right so you can you can offer help without having somebody expose um maybe before they want to um, and then, of course, you can say, are there people in your family I could, you want me to talk to? Um, in, in addition, we are business psychologists. So as a resource to you, you might not know what to do at all. You might be concerned. You would want to pick up, be able to pick up the phone and say, these are the things I'm observing. How do you advise I step in or I, um, I uh, address the concern, or do you think you should address the concern? 
Um, also, you might have EAP resources uh, in your handbook or in your benefits, and that would also be a place to go. Great, thank you. Any other uh, questions that anyone would like to put into the chat box? We could go ahead and address those for us. We do have a few minutes left. Any scenarios you want to talk through? Um, one question I got a couple of days ago was, um, I call, you know, I did, I am familiar with using my attorney on a regular basis and I am getting good uh, recommendations, but on some things, what the attorney, my, my attorney might say is, you could do this or this or this, it's your choice. And I don't know how to sift through the benefit of one of those options over the other. Um, so sometimes attorneys, while they are giving good options, they don't want to be responsible for advising you on what decision to make. And then you're left trying to figure out which option. That's when you would call somebody like me or the virtual board and have resources to help you as leaders think through what you want to do and what you need to do. Um, so that was another question that uh, I thought might be relevant to all of you. An, an, another question came, um, what if somebody at home uh, gets in co is in contact with somebody with the virus, um, but has no symptoms of their own and they're coming into work? That was another scenario. But again, we can categorize a whole bunch of these scenarios and in five or 10 minutes, drive the scenario, the, the, the start to finish, and then you have a collection of them and to what Christina's great point is, it reassures you as the leader or leaders, and you can reassure your employees that there are a set of um, steps to support the protocol. And I think that that's probably the most important thing as you anticipate bringing people back to the office um, is to have some of that, rather than worrying what if, to actually have some scenarios built out and in place for you. I mean, remember, you all, I mean, the 20 people who are on the call, you're here because you're anticipating um, the, you're anticipating these questions being asked and you want them answered. So we've tried to do a good job manufacturing work. Rick and, and, and um, Ann and, and Ron have come together to, to help us think this through. Um, and again, it's another set, set, set aside some time to build these scenarios so that you're not going to bed wondering what if. That's not healthy for you. And it doesn't convey, it, it's harder for you to convey confidence to your employees. Um, so um, again, it's, it's kind of like, um, it's at your fingertips. So Christina, any other thoughts? Um, I, just to add to the first question that Rick passed to us related to signs to look for in your staff, um, everybody's different. Everybody wears their stress differently. I'm sure you can think of people you work with that the moment that a hair is out of place on their head, you know about it. Um, and other people that might have something really terrible going on in their lives and you can barely even tell, you know, maybe they're just eating something different for lunch um, than they normally do. So I would encourage you, you know, as Stacy mentioned, start with knowing your staff, have those proactive conversations, um, do what you can to listen and just ask how it's going, you know, what's been going well since this time, what's been a little bit uh, more challenging during this time. And sometimes just those couple of basic questions can start down a path where your spidey senses might go up and you might leave that conversation feeling like, I'm not sure if they're okay. You know, I might, I might want to check on them again. Um, and that little notion just tells you that there's something there that you feel like might be off. Um, Trust your own intuition. Yeah. So, so it really conversation, um, Anything that you think could be a factor, obviously you don't want to be pestering people like, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? And then making it a thing. But at the same time, I think people err on the side of reaching out less than they should versus too much. Um, so if you have that sort of spidey sense, go up, follow it, talk to some people they're comfortable with at work, ask them how they think they're doing, you know, how do people in general think that each other are doing? 
um, we've noticed a huge uptick at our organization of just people needing that mental health support. We actually brought in a clinical psychologist to talk to our staff about what's happening. And I got a lot of notes from people after saying, I was really struggling. I cried during that session. Um, this was so helpful. So I, my personal notion is I think people are struggling a lot more than we realize. Um, so best to assume that there's more of a need there than, than not as much as you might be and thinking. And just to, to tag onto that too, is people don't have a language for, for this, right? This is brand new. So this sense of being, you know, forced to have, to live with uncertainty for so long. So sometimes when you ask, how are you doing? People won't have words for it. So, um, you know, sometimes just, uh, you know, letting people know you understand. You know, I'm seeing, actually somebody just texted me a question uh, and it goes like this. Um, what's the difference, between, how do you tell the difference between somebody who's struggling with stress or somebody who is just low performing? And I think in these times, that can be very challenging. You might really have somebody who is paralyzed or highly anxious about leaving their home uh, because they're worried it's too soon or they are afraid that the workspace is gonna, you know, they're, they're afraid. Um, and that person might be very different how you handle versus somebody who has over the, for the last several weeks, not been easy to um, keep accountable and now it's another thing about I don't I'm I'm not comfortable coming to work and it feels like a misuse of, um, you know a misuse of the opportunity. So I think those are difficult things to be sensitive and also to be the boss. Okay, well it is now uh, four o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up the call. But I do want to thank everyone for joining us on the call today. Uh, thank you to Stacy and to Christina for their excellent presentation. Uh, we encourage all of you to share with us your thoughts on topics you'd like to see covered in future calls, and we'll do our best to address them for you. Please stay tuned to your email as we announce our next call. And if there are other manufacturers in your network you think would benefit from this information, please feel, fear, feel free to share this with them or let us know and we'd be happy to reach out. As I mentioned earlier, this call has been recorded and an archived version will be available on our YouTube channel and in the COVID-19 resources section of our website. Thanks again, be safe, stay healthy, and we look forward to seeing you very soon. Goodbye, everyone.